the Hermetica, the lost wisdom of the pharaohs, written by Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy, read by me, Master Case. Contemplate Creation, Chapter 4, Contemplate Creation. In this chapter, Hermes teaches us how to see God by contemplating his creation. When we look at the world only with our physical eyes, God is nowhere to be seen. But if we look with our thoughts, we see with spiritual understanding. Suddenly, God is everywhere. In this ecstatic state, everything we see and touch is known to be part of God. And we understand that God's whole purpose in creating the world was so that through it, we could see him. The cosmos is his body, and we can come to know him by contemplating its extraordinary order and beauty. Hermes asks us to consider the constant revolutions of the stars in the night sky, the laws of fate, which he calls necessity, the goodness of everything that has happened and is happening. Could... This all be so perfect without a, supreme, without a supreme mind which maintains such exquisite order. Hmm? Could it all just be happening accidentally? It reminds us of the marvel of our own birth. Who created us? I mean, who created us in the womb? Huh? Who perfectly crafted the individual details of our bodies? Statues and portraits don't just happen. They are sculpted and painted. Surely such a work of art, as beautiful and complex as our own physical forms, must be the work of a master craftsman. The modern view is that we are a creation of the laws of nature. Hermes would not disagree with this. He would simply ask, who, dis who decreed these laws? <clears throat> he is trying to return us to childlike sense of all in the face of the wonders of life. The world is a miracle, yet we take it for granted. If we take the time to reflect, it becomes obvious that we are surrounded by profound mysteries. The universe is gigantic; is a gigantic work of art, signed by an unknown master. Humble amazement is a prerequisite for coming to know God. Contemplate creation. Ask Adam to flash a ray of his illumination into your awareness, giving you the power to grasp in thought his sublime being. For the invisible may only be seen with thoughts which are themselves invisible. If you can't see thoughts, do you expect to see Adam? Look with your mind, however, and he will appear to you, manifesting himself without reservation throughout the whole universe, so that you may see his image with your eyes and hold it with your own two hands do you think adam is invisible don't say that nothing is more visible than adam he created all things so that through him you could see him this is adam's great heart that he manifests himself in everything he manifest he manifests himself in everything everything can be known including the insubstantial just as mind is known through thoughts, so Adam is known through his creation. Adam is the all-encompassing author of entirety, weaving everything into the fabric of reality. Because creation is visible, we can see the creator, and this is the purpose of his creation. Since he is always creating, he can always be seen, so we should think and marvel and realize that we are blessed with knowledge of our Father. To know Adam's being, contemplate him in thought. To see him with your eyes, look at the exquisite order of the cosmos, the necessity, which governs everything you perceive, the goodness of all that has been and that is coming to be. <clears throat> look at matter filled full with life and see Adam pulsating with all he contains. Contemplate the cosmos as his ancient body, which is ever prime and new, See the planets circling 
in eternal time, see the spiritual fire of the heavens turned to light by the sun and shed as goodness upon the world. See the ever-changing moon which governs birth, growth, and decay. See the constellation of the bear which never rises or sets but stays ever a fixed point, an axle around which the circle of the zodiac revolves. See the comets which are called prophet stars. For when some future fate awaits the world, they emerge for a few days from their invisible home below the circle of the sun, which is it, who is it that maintains such exquisite order? The sun is the greatest god in the heavens, a king to whom all the others pay homage. Yet this mighty God humbly submits to have smaller stars circle above him. Who is it that he obeys with all? Each star travels his appointed range of space. Why don't all stars run the same course? Who is it who is assigned to each its place? The bear revolves around herself and carries around with her the whole cosmos. Who is it that appointed her this task? Who is it that fixed the earth and confined the sea within its shores? Someone must be maker and master of all this. It couldn't just happen. All order must be created. It is only that which is out of measure which is accidental. Yet even disorder is subject to the master. Who is yet to impose order upon it? If only it were possible to grow wings and soar into the air, poised between heaven and earth. You would see the solid ground, the flowing rivers, the wandering air, the penetrating fire, the circling stars, and the encompassing heavens. What joy to see all this, borne along by the one impulse to perceive the unmoved mover, moving in all that moves, he who is hidden manifest through all his works. Consider for a moment how you were created in the womb. Think of that skillful workmanship and look for the craftsman who made such a beautiful godlike image, who traced the circles of your eyes, who pierced your nostrils, ears, and mouth, who stretched your snoos and tied them fast, who built your bones and wrapped your flesh with skin, who separated your fingers and flattened your feet, who shaped your heart and hollowed your lungs. Who made your beauty visible and concealed your guts within? How many crafts have been employed and how many works of art created to form one human being? Statues or portraits don't just happen without a sculptor or painter. Has such a sublime work no creator? In chapter 4.